Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to live case and lecture number two, Power and Coronary Access. It is a great pleasure to see uh, the lifestyle in Toulouse with our friends uh, there. I don't think they need any introduction, Dr. Um, Dumonil and Dr. Cheche, <clears throat> who will be doing two cases joined by an expedite panel uh, by Dr. Park, Dr. Ahn, Dr. Yin, uh, Dr. Naganuma, <clears throat> and Dr. Ashok Seth. Um, it will be a great session today. Hopefully, everybody will enjoy. And again, thank you for uh, the invitation today for having me moderate. Dr. Lars Sondergaard will be recorded and uh, will give his, le his lecture remotely. So <clears throat> let's move on. DDA, the floor is yours. Yeah. Welcome. So uh, good morning or good afternoon, everyone. So it's a real pleasure for us to uh, broadcast uh, two uh, cases today with my friend and partner, Nicola, uh, that you all know. Uh, Gregor will be uh, the nurse uh, uh, helping us today, and uh, Rosa will be uh, the circulating one. Uh, so, Nico, maybe we can start with the case uh, presentation. Yeah, Didier. So the, the patient we're going to treat today is an 85-year-old lady suffering from CVRS, of course, symptomatic and I would say class three shortness of breath. You see that it's quite small, thin lady having past medical history of hypertension, paroxysmal atrial fibrillation. Uh, and during the preoperative screening, nothing remarkable, no mildly impaired renal function. And thinking about TAVI, uh, interesting to note uh, on the ECG, a sinus rhythm with, with the right bundle branch block. On the next slide, you will see the, the transthoracic echo result. So, of course, confirmation of severe aortic stenosis, normal uh, systolic LV function, no significant severe other diseases, valvular diseases, and uh, no uh, <clears throat> severe pulmonary hypertension. So what is more interesting is the CT scan analysis. Of, of course, thinking about uh, TAVI in this octogenarian lady, you see at the level of a landing zone, the annulus is 23 millimeter perimeter derived, and you have a, a video scoring, scoring from the bottom to the top, showing that to you, the LVOT is 23 millimeter perimeter derived, sinus of Valsalva 29.8, and uh, um, regarding the coronary issue, coronary obstruction issue, we have uh, a left coronary artery uh, taking off at 10 millimeter with a VTC at four millimeter, right coronary artery slightly above at 13 millimeter VTC at four, and the STJ is at 26 millimeter. So we, we could summarize that DDA uh, um, with a quite small uh, sinus of Valsalva and low deck off of the left main. Regarding access, no issue. You see uh, regular and comfortable diameters on both sides. And uh, you see a free cusp uh, view projection. Uh, you will commend that, Didier, but the, the cusp overlap view in that patient predicted by CT scan was a little bit less comfortable. So Didier, maybe let's discuss now yeah. um, what is interesting about that case, the issues. Uh, regarding sizing, choice of valve, coronary issue, and uh, and the pacemaker uh, issue also. So exactly, thank you, Nico. So Eberhard, Ashok, uh, all our friends in the panel. So here is the patient that we have to treat today. So briefly, just to present the setup of the patient, and then we move to the discussion. So it's going to be an optimized, streamlined uh, transfemoral TAVI with uh, six French access on the right radial artery. Uh, I will sing a five French uh, pigtail just to guide the procedure and record the blood pressure at the same time. And we have obtained a, a two proglide, a double proglide closure. Usually I do one proglide and one angio seal eight French at the end, but the, uh, uh, the uh, angio seal has some uh, issues in terms of production. So today it's going to be the regular double proglide uh, technique. Uh, it, has, it's, it has been echo guided puncture and it houses a, a 14 French shift for the Evolute Pro Plus platform. So if we switch now just briefly to the NGO. So here is uh, what is regularly the uh, cusp of a lab view. Normally in the RAO codal projection, uh, we have that superimposition of the right and the left coronary cusp. But here, the, uh, uh, given the axis of the aura, it's uh, almost impossible to achieve. And in, when we are in RAO codal, we have that free, free cusp view, in fact. And if we want to move to the uh, uh, real cusp of a lab view, 
Uh, I'm going to get it here. This was the, yeah, here it is. You have this uh, yeah. very extreme projection. It's uh, REO 50, codal 30, even more. We can expect our REO 50, codal 40. So just to deploy the valve, it's going to be a little bit tricky. Uh, so what we're going to do is to start maybe in that projection for the deployment and then move back uh, to the uh, uh, regular frequency view to uh, to finalize. Uh, so uh, as Nico has mentioned, uh, maybe Eberhard, you could uh, provide us with uh, your, your insights in terms of uh, vibe selection, what would you do in that lady with a small anatomy, just in a gray zone between two valve sizes, whether it be whatever device we select, it's exactly in the middle between two valve sizes, whether it be a Sapien 3, 23 or 26, Evolute Pro plus 26, 29, or even a a portico, whether it be a 25 or potentially a 20, 20, uh, 27 uh, millimeter device. So we have all these uh, challenges, and even for the accurate neo, it's exactly in the in the gray zone. Uh, so we have to uh, to discuss that, uh, what to do, and then we we're going to discuss uh, the the technique. Uh, so please uh, feel feel free uh, to provide us with your your comment, uh, Ebert. Thank you very much, uh, Nicola. Hello, uh, great to see you also on stage, Hi. and maybe. Maybe what we can do is um, uh, we we let's go to the panelists who have their opinion. <clears throat> Maybe we can start with uh, with Ashok. Uh, what would you do in this case, uh, Ashok? So, so a very interesting case. But, but we have to understand. Yes, the coronaries are low. Uh, certainly, the left coronary uh, left main is is low. But on the other hand, we also got to keep in mind it depends upon the size of the valve we use because. The risk of coronary occlusion is related to interactions between the, the valve late leaflet lengths, the sinuses, the size of the ostia, the STAG junction. And so it's not on a one particular measurement that we actually do it. So I, if I was doing this case, yes, 30 millimeters of sinus is what I would need for a 29 millimeter valve. Uh, the STJ junction is high. I would be able to protect this. But if I can actually go for a 26 millimeter valve, I would perhaps be good enough for avoiding a complete hard block on a presence of a pre-existing right bundle branch block. And this is a small lady, so I may be able to get a, a you know, least amount of patient prosthetic mismatch. I would be okay with a 26 millimeter in such a situation of a small lady for both benefits. And that will... Prevention of coronary occlusion as well as prevention of a, yeah. of a complete hard block. Babu, what do you think? Yes, so I think that this is a very, you know, the interesting and the difficult case. Uh, VTC is a four and the left coronary height is a 10, definitely borderline. So at this moment, I think the audience is wondering the which valve, balloon expandable or self-expandable valve is suitable for this case. And uh, so I think that this is a very debatable, uh, you know, patience to discuss the, is that the optimal type of the valve. Yeah, what's your opinion? What would you take? Yes, yeah, so I think that, you know, the so Safian valve would be good. Also, we can do Evolute R system. So whatever the, the valve type is, uh, I think, uh, you know, the for this case, I would, would prefer some coronary protection. And then we can put the Safian or also we can put the Evolute system. And what size? It's a, uh, what the size Safian, the... Safian 20, 23 and Evolute 26. Jean-Mille? <laughs> yeah. More interesting. What is, it's a very what interesting you case, I think. The, <laughs> even though patient age is uh, more than 80, I think a patient age implantation is a big one problem. So the baseline rhythm is a uh, uh, bundle branch block. So the, uh, personally, I favor the, the sub 3 at 20, uh, 23. In addition, yeah. regarding the coronary occlusion, one important uh, predictor for coronary occlusion would be the calcification. But the valve calcification is not so significant based on mm. the uh, 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 fluoroscope. So the, I don't think the, the risk of uh, coronary obstruction is uh, too high. Yeah. So, the, so I guess, I, I guess, uh, <clears throat> Nicola, uh, DDA, I'm the only one that would take an evolute here. Um, yeah. But I'm all with the outcast here. So, but I can see you having a handle there. Uh, yeah. Is, so um, I, I would take an evolute. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So. It, 
It's, it was a, a very important discussion that you had, and it's exactly what we discussed yesterday uh, with Nicolas. First, the valve uh, choice. Sapient free would have made uh, the job pr properly for this lady, but we do believe that a 23 would have put her at too high risk of patient prosthesis mismatch, because as you mentioned, the amount yeah. of calcium is not excessive. Uh, here, we had a, a very high gradient. It was, uh, the peak to peak was close to be 70. So it's a, a, a ventricle that wouldn't, uh, we, will not afford any uh, regurgitation. So if we put a device first that is too small and we leave the lady with a, a, a paravalvular regurgitation, we, don't, we, can't, uh, we could expect an unfavorable uh, outcome. So we want yeah. something that seals. So for a sapient free, it would have been a 26. So mm -hmm. potentially here, uh, some issue with uh, the coronary arteries. So we decided to go for a self-expanding platform. It's going to be at the Evolute Pro Plus. And a 29, uh, why 29? Uh, because we want to make sure that we seal. And there is a trade-off. We accept to have potentially an heavy conduction disturbance that is uh, quite that is probably likely to occur given the right bundle branch block with a large uh, QRS at baseline. Uh, but we will try to adapt the, the depth, not as high as we do usually, just to take opportunity of the constraint portion of the Evolute platform and just to avoid to put the 29 millimeter diameter in the sinuses. So if the 29 that represent the inflow are slightly around the analyst and a little bit below. Above, it's going to be something like 20, uh, the, the cage is 20, 24, 24, 25, so it should be favorable. May I just yeah. comment one Did you comment. consider 26? Yeah, I'm we sorry, considered yeah. the 26. Yeah, yeah we considered it, and uh, the, the, the issue was exactly the same as with the 23, sapient free, mm -hmm. to end up with some regurgitation. And we do believe yeah. that this small lady with a very dynamic left ventricle mm -hmm. is not going to accept any regurgitation. So it's better to, to leave her with potentially a red, uh, heavy, um, a complete heavy block rather than a, a massive uh, or even moderate yeah. aortic regurgitation. Uh, okay, Nico, so we have, have uh, one comment just, I have, uh, and I think I just wanted to emphasize the advantage of uh, Evolute R would be the recapturability. So when, when Nico was once he's deployed it, he's, he's going to be able to assess the risk of coronary occlusion before yeah. releasing the valve and recapture it if it was needed. Mm -hmm. yes. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think it's one one of the the features of the Evolute platform or over uh, recapturable self expandable mm -hmm. devices mm -hmm. that that make them wise in that situation. So, mm -hmm. just before to to enter and uh, deploy the valve, you know what one of the objectives in that case and in our regular cases now is to try to have a commissural alignment of a, of a prosthetic valve as regard to the native anatomy. We know that it's not always 100% predictable, but one of the first steps to, to do in order to try to reach that is at the time of introduction to align this flush port here, not uh, looking at the at the top, but looking at three o'clock like that. So the second operator is just to present the handle in that way. And, and then we will see how we can uh, adapt slightly in order to try to read commissural alignment. Mm. So this so is a very important what, point. Yeah. What, pro Not what projection are point. you starting out with? Uh, I think we will, uh, the, the, okay, the easiest and, and, and the better uh, to, to confirm your commercial mm, alignment mm, is mm, to go mm, with mm. A, a right left cusp of a view, but for the reasons yeah. Didi mm, explained, okay. in that okay. case, it won't be possible. So we'll go to the, the free cusp view mm. that we have mm. uh, recorded before. Yeah. Yes. Flush and port so, is uh, three o'clock. Yeah, okay. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, the flush port is at three o'clock, yeah. Mm -hmm. So you see, it's going to be a very extreme projection. So it's a, it's a quite difficult one. And so we were going to start with the cusp overlap technique. We already have, a, as a safety uh, net, we have a six French uh, shift into the venous system. We uh, don't like to, uh, to leave a right ventricle lead that is not uh, necessary. So we're going to pace on the wire. So we are prepared. One end of the crocodile clamp is directly connected at the skin screws that has been uh, obtained. And the other, one, the other hand, Nicolas has connected it to the, to the, the tip of the wire. So we are ready. Yeah. Uh, so uh, maybe okay. we, can, uh, we can start. We're going to start uh, high for yeah. this uh, lady. So as you see, Didier is, is positioning the, the capture quite high in order to avoid as much as possible interaction with, uh, with a membrane septum and the conduction tissue. And uh, as long as the prosthesis is being unshifted, mm -hmm. she this, he, this, he, yeah, he allows it to dive to the correct and uh, target implant depth that is currently that one. Yeah. Yeah. So let's uh, record nice. that just yeah. for you, Gregoire. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
So not uh, not extremely high at zero as we do uh, regularly, but let's say are something around two or three millimeters, mm -hmm. uh, just to make Very sure nice. that we minimize the yeah. risk of conduction disturbance. Okay. So we're going to reach the node three. So yeah. Rosa is going to pace, pacing on. Okay, and let's uh, yeah, it will open, stabilize inject. the mm -hmm. the prosthesis makes the work e easier for DDA. Now I'm speeding up because we're occlusive mm -hmm. and now mm -hmm. I can cool down. Yeah. And it's okay. So let's see what we uh, what we have here. And as you uh, off, yes, thank you. As you mentioned, we need to assess uh, very things. So you you see, met yeah. was on this. So there is a complete heavy, heavy uh, block. Uh, yeah. uh, uh, on this. Hey, so we're gonna see. So it's a trade off. We're gonna see if we need to. Uh, uh, repositioning higher uh, puts the patient at higher risk of heavy uh, of uh, coronary mm -hmm. obstruction. So it's a trade off. Yeah. Let's yeah. see. Okay. So let's record that first. So the depth is the one that we uh, we wanted. It's about yeah. to be two. We have a little bit of parallax, but we'll correct yep. that. But, correct uh, that. So far, um, and and the valve is not uh, yet free from the catheter from the catheter. Really? So the performance regarding the the PV leak mm. is not yet the maximum, but we have quite a satisfactory result. I think DDA. <laughs> In that projection, you perfectly yeah. see. On the, on the left sinus, uh, the left cusp pushed by the frame, and you see hold the space that you have between the, this left cusp and the, the walls of the sinoid tubular junction, the walls of the valsalva to allow for coronary perfusion. So it's reassuring also. Yeah. And uh, looking at that, um, even though we have this uh, third degree heavy block that appeared, I, I'm, I don't feel like um, um, putting the valve uh, uh, almost slightly higher. You no. know? I think so what's, uh, I think it's a what's very, your uh, opinion? Very nice position, guys. Yeah, I think yeah. it's a yeah. very nice position. I would not put it any higher because then you might slip up. up and I think we, exactly. as, as you said, the trade-off is there. And it's a quite the oversized valve. So I, I think it's a perfect thing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what you did. And the it's other uh, information yeah. is that uh, there is no uh, no leak, no leak uh, so yeah. far. No leak so yeah, far, yeah. and the valve is not yeah. yet uh, uh, deployed. Huh? Great. Okay, so, so uh, TDA, TDA, I have yeah. one question. Is uh, you know you select the 29th the Evolute the R Pro, and the, how much uh, the you know oversizing on perimeter basis? So 20 is how much oversizing? No, I keep the so just uh, before I answer your comment, let's go back to the hemodynamics. So you see the pacing lead is disconnected and the patient has recovered its uh, her own uh, sinus rhythm with still a right bundle branch block. Mm -hmm. So I think we can be optimistic nice. at the end. It is. So yeah. it, it, it recovered in less than two minutes. So it was just a contact with the system. But so it's uh, really reassuring. No mm -hmm. enlargement of the uh, PR interval, so I think it's okay. Mm -hmm. So we're gonna one uh, uh, keep it for the final release. I, I, yes, yes, can yes I just shop, please. That, uh, that I normally would like to wait for five minutes for the valve to expand yeah. completely because at the mm -hmm. end of the day, at that's the stage where you want to see coronary occlusion as well, and therefore that yeah, would have exactly. been my practice uh, to let it expand itself mm -hmm. completely. And then so the we're gonna project, follow uh, follow your advice. So what we're going to do is to expand the valve, wait for five minutes for the final uh, um, assessment, and we still have the opportunity. Uh, I don't think that uh, it's going to occlude the coronary artery. No, so uh, thinking about what uh, we've yeah, seen yeah. in the CT, I think I'm, 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 I'm fine with that. And to be honest, I'm watching at the clock. It's been, it's been four minutes and 37 seconds, yeah, exactly, yeah. When we, uh, before we touched uh, the, uh, the analyst. Uh, so let's repeat the NGO, follow your advice, Ashok, and then uh, okay. see what we have. Okay. Very nice. Uh, uh, very yeah, nice. very good. I think coronary obstruction okay. doesn't matter. Yeah, it doesn't matter. Yeah. Yeah, there is a very close relationship between the leaflet and the ostium mm -hmm. of the left main, yeah, but yeah. there is still room. Yeah, there, there is room. Okay, so let's uh, release, Nico. Yeah. Uh, so uh, for the release, we like to still continue to, uh, to pace just to, uh, to make sure that uh, we uh, maintain that position. 120, you can pace. So pacing of. You take the tension out a little bit. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So Nicolas has mm -hmm. done it. You see the the location yeah, of the yeah, Nascon, yeah. but this is a very important comment about. And I'm okay. Yeah, gently, and I'm just maintaining it. the coaxiality, pushing nice. a little bit good, on that. Good, good. Thank wow. you. Good. Good. Excellent. Okay. 
facing off and let's see we may have the same uh, so we don't even have any uh, conduction uh, abnormality mm -hmm. here so let, Nico mm -hmm. I will let you uh, manage the sure okay so uh, um, uh, Didier I would like to yeah uh, not only congratulate uh, the two of you or the three of you but what I would like to stress out here or to point out is what comes so naturally with you the important steps that I would like to comment on number one you yep. started high, you started high and let the valve come down instead of going in and let mm -hmm. the valve come up. Mm -hmm. So that was the very first important point that I that I saw beautifully. The valve didn't really dive in and you took a little bit up into the uh, two to zero position. Mm -hmm. That was very nice. You paced uh, for the deployment and then by uh, by lifting up the wire, you, you disengaged the tip um uh, into the into the uh, into the free space so you could uh, you could pull it back uh, right away so many things that come out naturally uh, with these two very experienced operators yeah, yeah. Uh, needed to be pointed out so uh, not to make the mistakes um, if you That's deploy the valve fairly high you have to be careful of what you're doing and you have to know what you're doing mm -hmm. any other comments uh, from yeah. you guys I, I do, and I thought it was a beautiful demonstration of how precisely the valve got positioned in a cuspal overlap. You well done, Didi. Yeah. I think it was it was truly exemplary. The only mm -hmm. only question I have for you is: you demonstrated but the facing guess. with the uh, stability of the valve, but there was no time that you checked it in the LAO projection, which is. I want you to uh, we, we, uh, we did it, in fact, afterwards. We, uh, okay. this, this is more like the um, uh, LAO projection, because if mm -hmm. you remember, the first uh, deployment was in the cusp of a lap with a very, very extreme RAO, uh, 50 and codal uh, 40. And, we yeah. and then we moved, you're exactly right, Ashok. We need to move from the cusp of a lap to the, uh, to the uh, left uh, LAO projection. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So here is the hemodynamics. So let's make it brief. It just allows for the stem frame, uh, enable the stem frame to expand furthermore. So Nicolas, quite yeah. positive, no? Yeah, yeah, quite positive. What is reassuring uh, is the, the wide difference we see with, between the uh, diastolic arctic pressure and LV and diastolic pressure. So at that step, a good predictor of a good outcome regarding PVD, of course, we'll confirm that in a few seconds by the NGO. Okay. So let's, uh, I would just uh, take a wire just to remove the pigtail to keep it safe uh, as much as we can. So there is no pacing at all for the patient and you can see that everything is, uh, is uh, stable. So let's do the final NGO. I'm going to put the pigtail here. It's been uh, not really far, four, five minutes, but more four and something. But let's uh, record mm -hmm. what we have. Good, good. Perfect. Excellent. Wow. Yeah, perfect. Perfect. Excellent. And, the, yeah. and we see the coronary arteries, what is uh, quite uh, important. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think coronary access is good and PBL, just the mild PBL. This is a very nice demonstration. It's possible to you. So I have one question. You did the, you're going to start the. Uh, the release point is, uh, you know, cent uh, the the center part of the pigtail ring, and the, that is uh, yeah. the cons consistent with the 29, 26, 23. Is how 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 some difference with the different size of the Evolu system. Is so a very important same? comment. So uh, bef yeah, before I um, answer, so I would just like to thank Nico. Nico is going to move to the other room just to uh, prepare the patient, and I will. He will uh, start the live transmission in five five minutes. So, uh, thank you, Nico, and I'm thank you in very five much. minutes. See you, okay, see you guys. Great. Very well done. Okay, I'm going to end up Wonderful. with uh, Gregoire. So just to answer your comment, there is no real difference between 26 and 29. The technique mm -hmm. is exactly as you mentioned, and as uh, Eberhardt has summarized, you have to you have to start with the marker band just in the mid portion of the pigtail, whether it be a 23, 26, or 29 evolute, and uh, then you uh, control the trajectory of the stand frame, the inflow towards the landing zone. And if you start with the marker band at the mid pigtail, the tip of the, uh, the catheter, the tip of the capsule will be uh, below the analyst. And this way you minimize the interactions with the conduction system. So here in that lady, it was a minimal protrusion. So that's good. Uh, so if we come back to our uh, um, more uh, cusp of a lap projection, we're going to see that we are a little bit deeper than what we see in LAO. That's mm. a regular, uh, regular finding. 
but it's uh, it's really important to follow these steps as Eberhardt has summarized. Marker bend at peak tail, control the depth, and start to fast pace when uh, the capsule reaches the third node. And then this way you have some things that are stable. Uh, so yes. what uh, we we discussed was the final depth for this lady, just to have okay. minimal conduction uh, disturbance. Okay. And at the end, okay. uh, uh, no regurgitation. That was most important to our opinion for that small lady with a very dynamic left ventricle and uh, no coronary obstruction. Great, great. Uh, so we're going to uh, close the question. groin while you are discussing, guys. I have one question to Didier. Uh, thank you for very nice, uh, congratulations, very nice demonstration. So based on the autogram, the, the annulus of the heart valve is uh, located above the coriosteum. So if uh, is it possible to re-engage the uh, coriosteum? Through the heart valve, uh, if it, uh, if a patient have some coronary issue in the future. So that's a very uh, contemporary concern. It's a very important point that you raise. We have to make sure that uh, we maintain the access to the coronary arteries as much as we can for the patient. And as you saw, um, the contemporary techniques uh, technique combine a cusp overlap uh, projection, the cusp overlap view, but also uh, the commissural alignment. And you've seen that Nicolas uh, uh, just rotated the handle at three o'clock just to maximize the chances of uh, uh, being aligned with the, the commissural uh, of the patient. And this is uh, something that we have to achieve just to make sure that uh, if the patient requires uh, any uh, coronary uh, intervention in the future, we, uh, we are not 100% sure to succeed, but we have the maximum chances to, uh, uh, to achieve it. And this is really important. Uh, this is an 85 years old lady, but if we imagine a younger patient, this is something that is really important to, uh, to keep in mind. So it's a very, very, very uh, important comment that you uh, just made. Mm -hmm. Dr. Lee, you have any comments from your side? Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, it, it, was it a comment, a question for me? Yeah, no, it's, uh, no. when, when, I, when we start from the middle of the tail, if, when the fi final read is the uh, bubble, it usually cut out a, a minute, one millimeter or two millimeter. If we M0 or one millimeter, it's possible to pop out, pop out the bubble. It, it usually happens so when we final infection the bubble. Yeah. Uh, what is being done and what is very important and what, uh, what, uh, what the team shows so nicely, so many people don't yeah. understand the, uh, the, okay. the overlay technique. They still do the classic way, go into the ventricle and pull up. What he showed so, uh, so beautifully was that you really start high and let the valve go down. And that's why you start at the middle of the pigtail. Uh, very important. And, and, um, that's what uh, brought this beautiful result. It's an excellent, uh, with an excellent result, not only uh, hemodynamically, but also for the rhythm. And you can see uh, when the valve touched the annulus, there was a short <coughs> period of block, but that's what you, what you can see, see, but it resolves after some time. And now he's closing with uh, the two, uh, uh, with the two proglides. Yeah, exactly. So, so, so there is a uh, still, uh, yeah, please feel free. And, and, and that is that, you know, whenever I have the suspicion of or, or a high risk of coronary occlusion, as in this case, I'd rather protect than not protect. Yeah. And there are for two reasons. Firstly, many of us then get into the habit and especially beginners, I would always suggest get into the habit of protecting at the, at the, at the site of the least or, uh, most possibility because then they prevent that catastrophic collapse and are able to deal with it. And so that brings me to the point that wouldn't it, if your advice and your teaching, would would it be? You're an expert and you got you got beautifully available. Yeah, you I think you're right. Doing. Yeah, it's and wiser. Like, it's uh, safer it's nice. if you start your experience maybe to protect. Uh, that uh, brings you to a slightly more complex procedure, and you're going to see Nicolas afterwards in the second case. Uh, but it's a slightly uh, a little bit more complex in terms of. Uh, Organization during uh, during the case because if you protect, uh, you need uh, additional uh, uh, arterial access. You need an additional uh, guiding catheter and so on. So, but I do agree with you that it's uh, it's a uh, uh, wiser and safer to do it if you think that there there may be a coronary uh, issue. Yeah. 
So here is the final uh, aspect of the, the groin of the patient. We don't have any bleeding. We're going to do the angiogram. Uh, so I don't expect major thing. So if we want to summarize, to peux revenir juste sur la caméra. So just to, uh, to summarize that case, that was uh, extremely uh, didactic. And even for us, because we don't do this type of cases every day, huh? even if we do uh, a lot of cases, so we still learn from uh, every single case. And what I learned from uh, you guys is that uh, first, uh, we need to have a thorough discussion of the, on the valve type and uh, on the sizing for this particular type of patient that uh, even if it's not an extreme risk of uh, mm -hmm. coronary obstruction, at least a, a, a significant risk of coronary obstruction. And I like the discussion between the type of valve and the diameter, uh, the size to use, because it's always a trade-off. There were three risks, coronary obstruction, PV leak and AV conduction disturbance. And we have, we have to find a balance uh, between all three risks. Uh, so we decided to go for a 29 evolute pros, accepting to be potentially a little bit deeper and uh, get some AV conduction disturbance, but not too deep just to minimize that risk. And that's the goal that we've, we, uh, we achieved. Uh, I learned uh, at last, uh, uh, so all the steps, uh, we re repeated the steps of the cusp of a lab technique in a contemporary way, plus commissural alignment. And at last it may be, uh, wiser, as you said, Ashok, if you have uh, any doubt on the potential risk of coronary obstruction to go for a wire, uh, catheter, catheterization of the, the coronary arteries, wiring them, whether or not to put a stent distally or not, this is something that we, uh, we can discuss. But it may be wiser if you start your experience and you think that you have uh, a risk of uh, doing so. Uh, so uh, for us, it was a real uh, pleasure with uh, Gregoire and the team. So final comments for you, and, and then uh, we're going to move to Nicolas, I guess, for the second case. Uh, well, Didier, it was, again, one of the fantastic demonstration of your expertise uh, and your teaching uh, abilities. Thank you so much. Uh, for you know, for for this extraordinary uh, performance on uh, on the Evolute Pro, and uh, and I, I really congratulate you not only for the acute result, but hopefully the lady will be doing well um, and, at at her age. Not so much worried about the conduction. Thank you very very much, and uh, and we can move on and to I, the next. I think. Okay. Great. Hi, Hi about again. Hi, Nico. Hi. So second case, second uh, second OR, Didier will join us in a few seconds. My colleague, Dr. Charbonnier, who prepared everything while we were doing the first case. Sabine, Cynthia, two nurses will work with us today. Um, the, the second case is about the issue of uh, uh, coronary protection and uh, discussion of techniques. So we can go directly to the case presentation to introduce this, uh, this issue. See, this patient is an 86-year-old man uh, of course, suffering severe RAS, uh, symptomatic, uh, good health status, independent at home, very little medical past history, hypertension only. Transthoracic echo, you will see, of course, confirms the severity on the next slide, the severity of the uh, aortic stenosis, nothing really relevant on that. Uh, normal body weight, no frailty evidence, or um, a good uh, uh, noctogener and in good shape, I would say. Let's go now to the CT scan. And on the CT scan, um, no, sorry, on the non-invasive studies, so ECG sinus rhythm, uh, complete LBB, nothing relevant regarding the laboratory investigations. And yeah, yeah. and something uh, important to notice uh, regarding the strategy, this patient has a significant coronary artery disease he had at the time of pre-op coronary angiogram, we discovered a very severe subocclusive calcified tight, tight uh, stenosis on the proximal and mid RCA. And as you will see, a very diffuse disease, but uh, moderate on the left coronary artery. So he, he underwent PCI with deaths uh, on proximal and mid uh, RCA after preparation uh, with rotablator uh, one month ago. So now coming to the CT scan, uh, you see uh, on the table at the bottom, the main measurements. So landing zone, annulus 25.8, uh, 27, sorry, there is a, a typo, 27.8. Uh, LDOT that was uh, uh, 32, uh, a SOV that was 31. Uh, but you see now the images, 
and uh, and um, the um, coronary height measurements. Uh, on the left image, you see something that I like to do is just to uh, put my CT slice at the level of a, a left main takeoff, measure uh, the, uh, the length of a uh, uh, cusp that is uh, in, re in related to this, uh, to this coronary artery, that is year 15, and just report that length at the level it would be after valve implantation to assess what space uh, will remain in the Valsalva sinus with regards to the STJ and to assess uh, qualitatively this risk of coronary occlusion. And you see here clearly uh, we, we have some amount of risk and it's confirmed by the VTC measurement that is in the gray zone at 4.8. Uh, the right coronary is either uh, higher, so uh, there is no uh, really issue regarding that. And you see STJ height and width, uh, 24 millimeter, 33 millimeter uh, regarding both measurements. So um, typically here, this case will be uh, the opportunity for us uh, to discuss these uh, uh, CT scan predictors of uh, nothing remarkable regarding the access. Uh, this uh, CT scan predictors uh, of uh, coronary occlusion, how to anticipate that risk. And of course, we'll discuss live uh, the strategies we can employ to try to mitigate and to avoid that, uh, that complication. So we can now go to the, the setting uh, because of that risk and the strategy we'll employ. It's a slightly adapted different than the uh, simple streamline uh, setting that you've seen in the first case. The patient is under conscious sedation. You will have a, an overview of, on the, of the groin and the, and the right arm in a few seconds. So the patient is, uh, is under conscious sedation. On the right arm, I, I still have uh, the, same, uh, the same thing that we had the, on the first case, six French radial sheath, housing a five French pigtail catheter. And on the two groins, we've made on the right side, uh, the main access uh, ultrasound guided puncture, two proglides. And on the left side, uh, where I've put a six French uh, sheath with a guiding catheter inside. And if you go now to the X-ray, I've recorded for you uh, the first uh, the first shot we've done uh, in the in the left coronary artery. You will see it in a few seconds. Um, <coughs> and we've put so this guiding catheter a wire down to a diagonal because there is a quite angulated mid LAD with calcified lesions. So I wouldn't uh, like to to uh, to destabilize that. And you see there is a nostril uh, left main uh, lesion and DJ that was asymptomatic, so not treated, but uh, as mentioned, there is coronary artery disease in this patient. So um, our strategy here is to go with this coronary protection, uh, to go with a, a 29 uh, Edwards Sepian valve. Uh, we'll discuss uh, that with you, of course, uh, the, not only the size, but the, the model of a, of a valve. And before to deploy the valve, uh, we'll predilate in order to do an angio with a, with a balloon inflated. It's a kind of a simple but dynamic uh, test that you can uh, have to assess and confirm or not your risk of uh, coronary occlusion, periprocedural coronary occlusion. Um, and it's sometimes useful. We'll see in that patient uh, whether it gives us some uh, interesting information or not. Very nice, uh, very nice, Nico, particularly the case preparation. And as we all know, you know, the, the best protection is to foresee the problems in order to avoid them. So, Ashok, that's your case, right? I, I think uh, it's been very well explained. Um, mm -hmm. Yes, coronary protection, except that when I say that, uh, I, I'm in favor of actually putting a stent down even than just the wire alone. Uh, and I'm in favor of using a guide extension catheter. Rather. I, I'll tell you the, the three apprehensions that I have. And this is real. Yeah, that yeah. if you occlude that ostia and have a valve in front, it's far more difficult to put a stent down, even if there's a wire in, than to bring it back. So a wasted stent doesn't matter. Secondly is the important point that I've, I've ha ha had this happen. Imagine. When I've got a guiding catheter into the ostia of the left main like this, and I expand a balloon expandable stent, 
I've had the guiding catheter pushed into the left vein, causing trauma to the left vein. So I tend to use a guide extension catheter and bring my guide out into the, into the aorta and have a softer guide extension catheter. Those are the two differences that I do in coronary protection uh, as far as I'm concerned. But I think it's a great case and I think there's going to be some learning coming out of this. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very yeah, much. Thank Ashok. you very much, Ashok. So you, you have on your screen the, the hemodynamic recording, so nothing the uh, the hemodynamic. really, really important, but just for your records, and Didier, you Yeah, have, you so have briefly just to see what we have at the end, the LV ED is about 20, uh, or it's slightly high, 40, 20, 20, and the uh, diastolic aortic pressure is 45, so we know where we are. Yeah. And uh, Ashok, I, I totally agree with your, with your comments, and... Uh, we have all, you will see in a few seconds, we have almost the, the same practice. So we will descend uh, the stand that was selected. Uh, we will descend the stand down to the LAD uh, before to go for the valve deployment, exactly for the mm -hmm. reasons you mentioned. And I, we agree uh, about that. Uh, it was not inserted uh, way before just to avoid any potential thrombosis, but it's prepared mm -hmm. on the table and mm -hmm. we, it will go down. Regarding the guiding extension use, it's something that we like also, um, but not always use in short frame processes like that. But you're right in, in longer frame processes where you have more frictions between your guiding capture behind the frame. Uh, sometimes it's really, really useful and makes things easier to have your, a guiding capture to protect from uh, those frictions. Yeah. So which okay, size so of balloon did you select, Nico? Mm -hmm. So it's it's the balloon that is in the Edwards kit. Huh? So it's a 25 millimeter, uh, 25 so millimeter cool. balloon. And what is also interesting and useful is to use the CT scan to try to work in the projection where you will see the, the best this conflict, potential conflict yeah. between your, your left coronary cusp and the left main. So we'll see, uh, but here the CT scan predicted that one, uh, LAO cranial view. So we're going to uh, do the balloon predilitation in that view and, uh, and record everything in that view in order so to try to assess. Yeah, yeah, to and assess the LAO cranial is definitely the best view for the, uh, uh, the astium of the left main. So it's a very important comment. So let's first uh, check the accuracy of the pacing on the wire. On va faire du 180. Allez-y, pacing on. The pacing off works, it's good. Vous êtes prêt à injecter, Sabine? Okay, so what okay. we will do is just do the, the balloon inflation and an NGO while inflating and just putting the pigtail a little bit above, above the balloon. Okay, in order not to have it gelled. Yeah. Okay, pacing on. And we're going to record that. Didier, balloon up for inflation. Okay, we're oh, going oh, to redo oh, that. Yes, no, it yes. was not stable. Yeah. Stop. Uh, facing off. So we're going to make it more stable. So sometimes it depends huh, when you do your balloon inflation uh, that you, do, you don't have this stability. So small thing is just to uh, have a maximum support on your stiff wire in the LV, as I'm doing with my right hand, and to push on the balloon to uh, block it on the external curvature of the outer. Pacing on. Okay. And let's record that. Okay, Angio. Good. Oh, so okay. You clearly see the calcium. Spitting down, facing off. So very, very interesting uh, recording. DJ, let's take a few seconds to comment that. Okay, so what we uh, let's withdraw the balloon and then we will yeah. come back to, uh, to that. Perfect. And I will let you just... It uh, is, in fact, a very important, uh, a very important recording, what you can see. Yes, particularly you. with regards to the left mm -hmm. main. <clears throat> yeah, so I, I let you comment that if you want, guys, and uh, no, we'll, we'll give you our comments afterwards. So what we, we see first is the stability of the balloon. The balloon is undersized, undersized mm -hmm. as compared to the annulus, but it's, uh, it's stable, so the valve is going to be Not stable. The pacing uh, is accurate. Uh, Second, we see the interaction first. Uh, we see clearly the left, uh, the left cusp uh, with the calcium uh, moving towards the left main. Mm -hmm. Uh, there, there seems to be a remaining gap. Yeah. Uh, so uh, we shouldn't expect a, a major obstruction, but we have to keep in mind that the device that we're going to use is going to be larger than that. Exactly. So another That's important uh, information for me, so no regurgitation. So potentially when I will expand the valve, I will kind of uh, respect a little bit my uh, tactile feeling. 
if I do have the impression that I'm pushing too much uh, on the anatomy, mm -hmm. uh, I may uh, just uh, withdraw a couple of CCs in terms of final uh, inflation because we still have the opportunity to uh, <coughs> balloon uh, to post dilate if necessary. If we were too aggressive at the start, sometimes it's uh, yeah, you end up with so uh, bad we situations. Know, we know DDA's tactile capabilities. <laughs> <so> we trust, <laughs> we trust kind of you, DDA. Okay. <laughs> yeah. but, okay. Uh, okay. So you see. Okay, Nicolas, yeah, what you size of a stand? It's a three point five. So it's a four. Yeah, it's a four four point five millimeter stand point for, right. by twenty six millimeter length. You see there is a very diffuse calcified disease huh, mm, yeah. on the left coronary artery. So I, I feel some frictions and difficulty to advance it more. So mm -hmm. I will just park it here. It's, it's enough advance. The idea, as you mentioned, a shock is just to avoid uh, afterwards to, mm -hmm. to have to descend uh, in an area where you have a friction between the native cusp and the frame of a prosthesis. Right. So here it's fine. And it's, the, the length has been chosen uh, to be uh, uh, um, enough importance, uh, um, both to cover the left main and to mm -hmm. go uh, to the aortic roots uh, mm -hmm. to make a gap between the, the cusp and the... Uh, so you want to be the, above the sinus to blood junction? Yeah, 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 a little bit. Mm -hmm. okay. You so know, I think if there I'm is, entering the valve. Yeah, yeah if, if there, there is some, the risk uh, looks like a coronary obstruction, you want to do... Uh, some snorkeling or you know chimney technique or just exactly match the the stand proximal. That could to be the the, uh, the final. Uh, yeah, that could be the final option. Yeah, if we have to deploy the stand, it's going to be a kind of uh, yeah snorkeling or chimney. Uh, so, but I think it's what Didier uh, yeah, mentioned. Uh, what Didier yeah. mentioned. Uh, what is important with with the uh, balloon va with, with the vavilo uh, with the, with the dilatation, you have this. Uh, the gap between the leaflet and the left main that would probably be a little bit closer with the balloon expandable valve you're using um, using a larger valve and using higher pressures but trusting his tactile uh, sense <laughs> his tactile uh, manual um, abilities yeah. we're sure yeah, yeah. we're going to get it great okay great. so you saw uh, I, just had, I just had <laughs> I just had to make small adjustment at the time of, uh, of advancing the, the prosthesis through the native valve. You can have some uh, interaction between your guiding capture, your delivery yeah. capture. So just have to adapt your position on that. So it turns back to the comment from As uh, Ashok uh, uh, before for the case uh, previous case, if you need to protect the coronary arteries, it's a little bit more challenging in exactly. terms of preparation mm -hmm. and movements during the case. Exactly. So mm -hmm. let's... Let's uh, go for that view, I think, Didier, for uh, the, the yeah. deployment. Um, That's the first angel. Maybe we'll yeah. be low, but we're going to check that. Of course. Yes. Angel. Yeah. Good, good. So, nice. yeah, what we see is that we are a little bit low as compared to our regular, uh, regular uh, position. Uh, here, again, we... we could say that we have also a trade-off to, mm. to do NDA be, be, mm -hmm. because of this risk of coronary occlusion. Right. And what we see is the, and what we know is that it will be the inflow portion of the frame that will uh, shorten at the yeah. time of deployment. So if we select the depth according to the uh, uh, outer, the outflow portion uh, as respect to the left main uh, height, uh, it should remain stable at that height. Yeah. Uh, I would go maybe a slightly higher, yeah, slightly. just below the left main, I would say. So and I can we have uh, the uh, the landmark of the guiding yeah. catheter also. So yeah. So I would go here probably. Here? Yeah. Okay. Let's recheck yeah. the the pacing. So everything is in place. The guiding catheter didn't move. The stance is well located. 180. Checking the pacing. So it's yeah. a kind of checklist before we move. We are happy with the position of the Stop. Uh, the top of the stand frame. Yeah. The pacing is accurate, so we follow your orders, uh, Nico. Okay, so I'm, I'm happy. So again, same maneuver uh, than for balloon predilatation, putting the maximal support on the stiff wire on the LV, uh, first for stability and second for uh, ensuring good contact for pacing. That is crucial here. And if necessary, we'll make small adjustment. We'll do an NGO while deploying. Mm -hmm. Uh, in order to have a small deployment and position uh, repositioning that uh, can be necessary sometimes. Okay. Okay. So pacing on. Oh. Now pacing is good. 
Ok, DJ, you can go. Injection. Ok, pixel out, advance a little bit, and you can deploy DJ. Ok. Yeah, I, feel, I really feel the, the pressure. Ok, bend on down. So I'm going to stop here. It wasn't the Facing full, off. full, uh, full uh, expansion of the balloon, so we still uh, can assess what we have, and then we'll come back again if we need for... Uh, ok. Yeah. I think it's uh, yeah, just as a safety uh, measure, so there is no Very conduction nice. disturbance here. Yeah. We may need to uh, go a little bit uh, more in terms of inflation, but let's see what we have. Because yeah. we see that there is that flaring both in the LVOT uh, and the uh, sinotubular junction, so let's see. Okay, we may park it just here, wire a little bit central, and do an okay. injection here. Great. So let's record that. So far, the hemodynamic situation is good. Yeah, so it's really nice. I think no acute uh, occlusion of left main. We yeah. would have seen that. <laughs> so there is some uh, regurge. Yeah, it but was a minimal control. Uh, yeah, amount, we, so we, we are, of course, we'll do a better NGO uh, for you to assess, but uh, uh, we are at an early phase after deployment. We know that with mm. a CPN3, we have to wait some minutes for the, the ceiling skirt to play its role. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I would say I'm happy, uh, I'm happy uh, with that. So, no, you would post dilate DDA, DDA maybe? Uh, potentially. <coughs> so that's, that's, uh, let's, let's discuss with our friends because we, yeah. we may have a little bit more foreshortening in the LVOT. Uh, there is, uh, we are getting closer to the left main for sure, but you have the, uh, the guiding after that is nicely uh, yeah. um, uh, located. So maybe just uh, provide uh, the fully, uh, full amount. Okay, good. And, uh, and see what we have. So well, let's go. So let me reposition the wire yeah. and I will follow you. Uh, Cynthia? We'll venir post dilate. Okay. Merci. So let's do it and then we will uh, we'll assess the need for uh, deployment of the stent or not. Okay. Donc, ça sera 180 de nouveau. Oui. Un peu plus bas. Yeah, let's go a little bit deeper. Like Perfect. that. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. Facing on. Uh, no. Are we connected? Not, yeah. yeah, maybe not. Okay, it's good. Yeah, here it is. Okay, Didier, balloon up. Okay, so now I can go. Okay, balloon down. <laughs> Still passing off. Passing off. Perfect. Good. Let you commit a little bit. So still good, good hemodynamic situation. So we're we're fine with that. Okay. I'm. A, withdrawing the delivery capture. Yeah. OK. So let's uh, bring the pigtail quite, and then assess with a better NGO. And it's true that sometimes we need to wait a couple of minutes, even yeah. sometimes 5, 10 minutes, just for the, uh, the outer uh, fabric, the external fabric of the serpent free to uh, expand furthermore. And then you get no regurgitation. But still here, the hemodynamic is fine. Uh, yeah. LBBB, a little bit larger, but no uh, AV conduction no, for, uh, no, disturbance. Yeah. The diastolic aortic pressure is close to be the same, 40 to 50. So it was, it's uh, in the same range. Okay, so meanwhile, uh, meanwhile, you can have a look at the, the final uh, MO recording. Mm -hmm. You have uh, it under your eyes, DJ, comment. Yeah. Uh, so uh, we see that there is no gradient. The diastolic aortic pressure is 50. Uh, LVD is exactly in the same range, so we are happy. Great, so great. I think okay. we, we can, yeah. So let's withdraw a pigtail from the LV. And, and do the, the NGO, NGO, the NGO. A bit higher. Yeah, I'm going to properly position that. And I can we can go directly for the NGO DDA because yeah. it will be also fine in the projection where where we did the, the BAV. It was LAO 30. 30 and cranial 15. Cranial just to see, 15. Uh, to better see the left man. I think it's a, it's a very important comment once again. Just yeah. To, uh, to and make sure that we assess the things properly. The bon effet. Okay, go. Good. Wow. Excellent. It's okay, no so PVR. Regarding, yeah, yeah, regarding the ceiling, it's fine. And now let's focus on the, what we see um, in the left coronary valsalva sinus. Um, if you, my interpretation on that is that you see the, the, the left cusp DDA yeah. pushed by the frame, but that is quite below, uh, far below the, um, the left main. And uh, we see quite a, um, a good perfusion of the valsalva sinus by the STJ. 
And you, we remember that the proximal cells of the sapion uh, are totally open. Huh? Yeah, it's not covered. So. It's not covered. So here I, I, I would say that the, the, there is, of course, obviously no acute risk of coronary uh, obstruction, yeah. but no delayed, neither. Um, so I, I would be reassured. That. Yeah, yeah. What, what about you? I, I would agree with that. I don't. I think there is still some gap, and I would not deploy this stent. I think there's no. Um, I don't think there's any acute risk of occlusion. There's still a gap. The leaflet tip is not reaching the ostium yet. I think it's a beautiful case. Fantastic. And just uh, maybe one, uh, as we have uh, five minutes, just one um, uh, comment I would like to get from you, Eberhard, Ashok, and all our friends. Uh, let's imagine that we need to uh, put a, deploy a stent because there is something at the left main. Yeah. Uh, would you go like that, or would you try to go through the struts of the, uh, the serpent free? What would, you be, would, would, you, would be your advice, uh, Eberhard? I would expand like that or I go would, through? No, I would go back i would take the stand back further mm -hmm. and uh, and go back even though chances that you have to go in remember that the, the, the patient has coronary disease and in case yeah. he in case he he gets in trouble you want to get in and it's a little bit more difficult to get in with this position than doing a chimney so i would probably pull it back a little bit more mm -hmm. okay okay good oh, okay didier i have one question for this case uh, you know uh, the usually calcium chunk looks like uh, some low density, although uh, the flow is good. Sometimes uh, very ambiguous cases, the calcium chunk is uh, occluded, uh, the sinus portion, something like that. So did you, you uh, sometimes check it up the IVUS for such like some mm -hmm. region? No, we, we, we don't have yet a uh, big experience on that, but the, the yeah. idea came from Flavio Rubik and his team. He, he published a, a paper on that in Euro Intervention recently and beautifully showed that this, uh, this IVUS assessment uh, is quite interesting and useful because it allows you, and that, that is maybe mainly the, the most important uh, result, it allows you to uh, uh, really understand and select cases where you don't need to put a, a, a prophylactic a, a, a chimney stent, that is not, uh, of course, a, a good thing if you can avoid it. Mm -hmm. uh, and in case of, uh, as you mentioned, in ambiguous situation, it provides you some guidance to confirm that uh, you have a risk and, uh, and to put the stent. But the main take of that is that in some situations where the angio by indirect visualization is not accurate, this additional tool provides you some guidance and uh, allows you to avoid unnecessary chimney stents. So uh, yeah, please go to this uh, to this paper and read it. It's it's really interesting. But that's definitely something that maybe we should uh, of course, of course, try when you yeah, are. Yeah, we, we should implement we will our try. practice with that. <laughs> Next try. time we will have our own experience. Yeah, we'll try. Right. So right. if we agree, I, I, I think I will withdraw the stent and the guiding yeah. after. And it's, it's uh, uh, to, uh, according to my experience, this is a very tricky part. So please, yeah. Nico, take the time because yeah. we may, uh, there is still a risk of dislodging the stent. Exactly. So I'm, I'm doing it. I'm, oh. I'm trying to be. Yes, please. Before removing the uh, stand, uh, can you engage more the guiding catheter to the sinus? Is it, if it yeah, is I, I, easy, easy? Yeah, I, I would. Oh. Yeah, yeah, I, I would be. Uh, uh, I, I, what I would do is just to engage it in order to avoid the friction uh, between the stand at the top of the frame, if, if it is what you mean. But I don't want to engage it too aggressively because I don't want to uh, dissect the osteo left main lesion, as you may, as you saw. So what I'm just going to do as uh, here is just to uh, slightly pull on the stance, be sure that we very, are actual. Very tricky part here, yeah, as GDM yeah, mentioned. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> be sure that we are coaxial with uh, the guiding capture because it's where, where and uh, how uh, dislodgements can occur. And I, I, currently, and actually, I feel some resistance. Some resistance, yeah. yeah. So I'm not going to pull too much because it, it's the way dislodgement can appear. And maybe the, the better is to, if I feel more resistance, DDA. But, uh, actually, I have two options. Either I pull on both stent and wire, yeah. everything else, or I advance a guiding, a guiding after extension just to prevent from any friction. And uh, and avoid uh, and avoid mm -hmm. that. Or further option to deploy, but <laughs> yeah, no, no, I don't want. To, I don't want to. <laughs> so what I, what I'm going to do, even though it's not the more elegant way, 
is maybe to pull on everything together Hmm. Likely, of course. Huh? You see the stance yeah. is yeah. starting to engage good, in, the, in a guy. Better, the coaxiality is better. Yeah. So it tells us okay. uh, how uh, small was the remaining gap uh, between Whoa, the uh, single good, good. junction and the, uh, good, good, good. and the coronary artery. Okay, you so uh, Nicolas will. Uh, you too have tactile <laughs> uh, senses, <laughs> friends. Yeah, my goodness. Fantastic. Yes. Good, good. Uh, so, Didier, okay. maybe you want to wrap up yeah. the case while I'm yeah, closing? Yeah. yeah. So, so, uh, so I think um, from the second case, what we learned, then um, it's always uh, important to try, to try to summarize because here it was uh, definitely a more challenging cases in terms of decision making and preparation of the patient. So it was. Uh, very important to have that uh, interactivity with you guys to discuss the opportunities, the options in terms of uh, protection. What do what material do we have to use to protect? Uh, do we have to put only a guide catheter, only a wire, a guide extension, put the stents, spark the stents more distal into the vessel? These are considerations that have to be uh, uh, dec decided before the case because it's not once you get the complication that it's uh, you're going to get the best outcome for the patient. So preparation is key. And inter uh, interaction with the, uh, the different members is very important. So we, I, I did enjoy the, the discussion that we, we had. And we nicely um, understood how important it is to watch the interaction of the uh, the stent of the uh, bioprosthesis, the guiding catheter, the movement of the calcium, well, when you are doing the balloon uh, angiography, all these steps are important to decide at the end or not to deploy the, the, the stent. And finally, Nicolas demonstrated uh, the safety, uh, the movements that are required just to uh, properly uh, withdraw uh, the stent if you don't believe uh, that you need to, uh, to deploy it. So uh, from our hand, it was a real honor and real pleasure to discuss discuss these cases with you guys and we thank you first for inviting us and second for the high level of uh, quality of uh, interaction discussion and we did learn uh, many things uh yeah you i would thank the team you. as usual yeah we, and, uh, we think the, the team, final word DBA is yours and Nico, <laughs> uh, that was taver at its best i have to no, say just... and believe me if ashok wants to spend some days with you i think that's the <laughs> highest you can get from him um, it was fantastic. Uh, we saw everything that you uh, challenge in today's world with Taver done in an elegant and safe way. Um, we were impressed by the results, obviously, by the selection criteria and by preventing problems. So uh, as, used to, as we are used to the cases from Toulouse, fantastic performance, great team. Uh, and great success. Thank you very much. And uh, our very best Thank you to guys. you, Nico. Great, great. See you Wonderful. Hope. Thank you, guys. Soon in the future. Take care. Yeah, with pleasure. Take care, okay, guys. Okay. Bye-bye. Take care. Take, Take care. Bye-bye. But I have to say, we saw two brilliant cases done in 30 minutes. Um, that, is, uh, that is pretty amazing. And uh, there were many, many tips and tricks that we could discuss um, while we are while we are waiting for the lectures, mm. Mm. that could go wrong. Actually, uh, you know, which this team was able to prevent. Uh, you know, at the last one was a very important one when he pulled back the stent. Imagine somebody pulling, uh, and then you have the stent sitting in the ostium. Um, many many things that we have learned from those two cases. Don't you think, guys? Yes, yes, definitely. I fully agree. Two cases, very educational case. Uh, the first case, uh, you know, small sinus and coronary height is low. And second is a very nice demonstration for coronary protection. Yeah, two cases, very educational. We learned uh, lots of things. Yeah, and, uh, and also the technique for self-expanding valves mm. <clears throat> was done very nicely with the new overlay, cusp overlay technique and the, uh, the commercial alignment. So uh, all the important points uh, have, been, uh, have been mentioned. And this panel has been very entertaining, I have to say. Yeah, uh, yeah. Brilliant, as always. Yeah, Ebad, you, you are now doing the uh, almost all case cursive overlap view, if you're gonna do the Evolute system. No, we, 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 except for extreme projections, 
we try to follow the, uh, the new recommendations. Interesting for you maybe, and I don't know whether Ashok remembers, the very early days I started with RAO because I always thought that I could see the membrane septum better than an LAO. Mm -hmm. And uh, I started the cases in RAO slightly quarter. And um, when I, you know, when Jean-Claude Laborde and I had our discussions, didn't like the RAO view uh, very much. And because we wanted to go streamline and proctoring and teaching, I changed to, um, to the LAO view. But now I think that we have pretty convincing uh, evidence that the, uh, the cusp overlay together with the commissure alignment helps re-accessing and uh, the, the depth situation. I think we will be overcoming one of the major problems, particularly uh, that I learned at Azan, you know, where you were used to discharge the patient the next day and one of the major drawbacks for uh, using balloon ex uh, and self-expandable valves was the unpredictability of uh, conduction disturbances and you had to wait. So maybe uh, that will change the situation a little bit. And I'm confident that we will have supportive data uh, coming out with this new technique. Mm. But many people still use the overlay and still use the traditional deployment, which really doesn't make much sense. You know, either you do it this way or that way, but uh, it's probably an educational process. So Eberhard, at, at, uh, one more uh, comment, I, because I missed the last part of it. Uh, so there was no chorea occlusion and they pulled the stent out. Is that correct? Is that what happened? Uh, yeah, he was, uh, you know, he, we decided or they decided not to deploy the stent. And because the stent and the frame, the, the coronary stent and the frame were in close proximity, you have to be careful to withdraw the stent. Otherwise, you would strip the stent from the balloon and then you have the stent in the end. So any, any insight from your side, Ashok? So that's that's why the the guide uh, guide extension catheter becomes very useful because yeah. it's far more flexible. So <clears throat> especially more so with the core val with, with an evolute R platform, where actually it's never co-aligned. It's coming from the back of the platform, and there's a tortuosity there, and the guiding catheter friction can be far more. Uh, so that was one point that. Uh, Guard extension, it's much smoother and easier to get the stent out. The Correct, second aspect yeah. is that uh, one has to come away from the ostea, at least initially, to be sure that there's no occlusion. Uh, what I was saying was that the guiding catheter can prop up the leaflet at a time when you're very close to the ostea and therefore injecting. And you certainly need to evaluate that by bringing the guiding catheter back and leaving the, just the wire out in that space. Uh, which is easier with the guide extension catheter than with a guide because the guide doesn't go back then to withdraw the stent. But you certainly yeah. need to bring it back and just leave the wire alone so that you have uh, you are able to see just the ostea with wire alone rather than with a guide catheter into the ostea. So um, I think uh, that as we move on now, we have the lectures. Uh, and we start with a recorded lecture from Dr. Sundergaard, coronary protection during TAVR, when and how. Uh, we have seen beautiful cases, so it fits very nicely into our topic. So thank you for the invitation to talk about coronary protection during TAVR. So in selected patients, coronary occlusion during a TAVR procedure is a rare but often a fatal complication. And patient at risk are patient both with native aortic valve stenosis, but a particular patient undergoing a valve in valve procedure due to failed surgical biprostatic aortic valves. And if we start with the native aortic valve, we know that from the pre-procedure screening, often using CT scan, we can identify patient at risk. It's often patient who have a low takeoff of the coronary arteries, patient with a shallow, sinus of a salva, a low sinus tubular junction, 
and long calcified cusps. For patients undergoing valve and valve procedure due to degenerated surgical fibrosis, it's the same risk factors with low coronary takeoff, quite narrow sinus of a salva, and low sinotopular junction. So particularly for these patients, we're now talking about what we call the VTC, the valve to coronary distance. And that again can be measured on CT scan in, and if it's less than four millimeter, we know that that patient is at a particular risk for coronary occlusion during a valve, valve procedure. It's also important to know what kind of surgical biprosthetic valves we are And you can actually divide these valves into two groups, extended biprosthesis, which can both have internal and external mounted leaflets. The external mounted leaflets is often mitral flow or trifecta. And then you can have the stentless biprosthesis. And the Valves which have a particular high risk of coronary occlusion are these with the external mounted leaflets and also stentless biprosthetic aortic valves. And it's also illustrated in this study, patient again with external mounted leaflets, the risk of coronary occlusion 6.4%, stentless valve 3.7%, and patient with internally mounted leaflets, of course, in a stentless valve is only 0.7%. So what can you do up front to, to also to try to assess the risk of coronary occlusion? Quite a few sites will do a balloon inflation using a balloon with the same diameter as the true inner diameter of the failed surgical valve, do a full inflation, and then simultaneously do an aortic root injection. And thereby you can actually see whether you still have patent flow to both the left and the right coronary artery. If you have concern about the risk of coronary occlusion, both in native uh, aortic valve stenosis, but also in valve for valve and valve procedure, there's two strategies which can be used, chimney stenting and basilica. So starting with the chimney stenting, what you do up front is that you position a guiding catheter in front of the coronary arteries at risk. You park a guide wire and the coronary stent into that uh, coronary. And then you do your valve implantation. And when the valve is in place, you assess whether there's actually patent flow to the coronary arteries. And if there's not, you pull back the stent and you deploy it. And again, it's important to remember that that stent should be so long that it can start in the left main artery and actually go into the sinus of a salva. So it's been a quite long stent, a chimney stent. And also for the patient, if you want to do a post annotation of the transcatheter heart valve, during that, you need to do a simultaneously inflation of the balloon in the coronary stent, like a kissing uh, procedure in order to not have, have collapse of the coronary stent. And that's often going to work here. So you have now patient flow to the coronary artery despite the valve is sitting there. One thing you have to understand with this procedure is that it will be very difficult in the future to access these coronaries when you have done a chimney standing. So how often are chimney standing done? There was a large study presented just last year, uh, more than 12,000 patients undergoing TAVI. Among those, it was only 60 patients, 0.5% who had chimney standing. 18 of these had a native aortic valve stenosis and 42 have a valve and valve procedure. But again, remember, Valve and valve procedure is quite rare. It's five to 10% of the patient undergoing TAVA. So for that, it's certainly much more than 0.5% of the patient who have chimney stenting. And you can also see that it makes a big difference whether you have a setup prior to valve implantation for chimney stenting. These are the one in the green box. That's a very low complication rate. On the other hand, if you do the valve implantation and you realize that you have an issue with the coronary arteries and try to do chimney standing afterwards, there's a much higher risk of death, myocardial infarction, cardiogenic shock, and also stroke and vascular complications. And what are the predictors from this study for having um, a, a coronary occlusion? You can see the main factor is absent of pre-valve implantation coronary protection and then also balloon expandable valve. So remember that 
it's much more safe to have the stint in place before valve implantation than trying to position after valve deployment. There's also been concern of what about these stents down the line among these 60 patients, 3.5% was reported as stent failure. One had a restenosis and one had a late stent thrombosis. Um, the other way to do coronary protection is the basilica technique where you do laceration of the cusp in front of the uh, jeopardized coronary artery. So you actually go in with a catheter, place it here in the bottom of the cusp in front of the coronary arteries, you perforate it with IF energy, and then you snare the wire in the left ventricular alpha tract, you pull it back, and again, using RF energy, you slice that guide wire up and make laceration of the cusp, and thereby it's going to split up, so when you implant the valve, the, the target valve, uh, you still have flow to the patent coronary artery. There are some anatomical criteria for using basilica, such as calcium, and of course, also, you need to have commercial alignment of the surgical valve. You want to do that procedure on in order to make it work. The outcome is, is pretty good. This is a 30 page study here, and you see there's a very low rate of mortality, and all the patients had patent coronary flow after the basilica technique. So, just to summarize, coronary occlusion during a target procedure is a rare uh, in patients with native aortic annulus but it's certainly at high risk for patients undergoing valve and valve procedure, particularly for, for stentless valve or stented valve with external mounted leaflets. Pre-procedural CT scan may identify patients at risk. Chimney standing is a relative simple and safe procedure, but there is concern about later re-access to these corners and also for stent failure. The silica technique is taking off in Europe and in the US, but is a more challenging uh, procedure than uh, chimney standing. So my final slide here is coronary occlusion during tarping. If you think about it, protect it. So if you have any concern that one uh, coronary artery is going to be occluded during a tarping procedure, protect it up front. Thank you. Okay, so we see DJ coming up. Uh, Dr. Wu, would you like to introduce him again? Okay, so the, I'm gonna very happy to introduce I We saw the very nice uh, demonstration for coronary. How can we do coronary protection? How can we do valve implantation also? And the DDA consecutively give a very important lecture about the coronary reaccess and the PCI at the tower and tips and trick. Okay, DDA, please. Coronary reaccess and PCI after TAVR, my tips and tricks. It's a real pleasure to provide this uh, lecture and here, is, uh, here are my disclosure. So the first thing we need to understand when it comes to coronary access post TAVI, is to, uh, the first message is, uh, is that it's a quite rare event. And when you uh, have a global overlook at all these registries and studies, overall 2.2% of the, uh, the patients required PCI in a time window between one to two years, so two to three years. So it's a quite first rare event, and second, that doesn't occur very early after the procedure. But it's not, uh, it's something that we may encounter uh, in daily practice. Uh, no, somewhat reassuring is the, the overall uh, coronary access uh, success rate that is uh, close to 94%, but on the other hand, it's not 100%. So it tells us that we need to acquire some tips and tricks just to be able to uh, get a successful access uh, to the coronary arteries of our patients after a TAVI procedure. So we need to acquire the uh, necessary skill set and have in our uh, toolbox many items to be able to cannulate the coronary arteries. Uh, so we, uh, the first, uh, one of the important thing is to try to understand what are the factors that are going to uh, influence coronary access post uh, So uh, namely, there are anatomical uh, factors. Uh, there are uh, the sinotubular junction dimensions, whether it be the height, the sinus uh, width, uh, the coronary height, and also the bulkiness at the, and the length of the uh, the artery valve leaflets. But also there are some device-related uh, factors uh, that uh, are uh, quite uh, important also to, uh, to understand. 
uh, the matrix of the fat, uh, the, the TAVI uh, device, the location of the coronary of the post, the commissural post, uh, the ceiling skirt and height, and the implant depth. And all these factors, anatomical and device and procedural factors, are going to impact uh, the ability to candidate the coronary arteries. Another uh, subgroup of factors is all that relates to the leaflets. So coronary occlusion may occur we first a bulky leaflet that just come, comes uh, in front of the ostium of the coronary arteries, in that example, the left main, or surrounding uh, leaflets of a failed bioprosthesis that just make a kind of sinus sequestration, uh, particularly for these externally mounted leaflet uh, failed bioprosthesis. So these are uh, factors that may uh, make it difficult to get access to the coronary arteries, and we need to get to know that. So, at last, uh, very important to understand the metrics of the device what, that we're going to use, uh, the device height, the diameter, uh, the, the shape of the device, whether it be tubular or it be a kind of constrained and tapered aspect. And if we play on the depth, we may impact the, uh, the final expansion uh, movement of the leaflets towards the coronary ostiums, but also the height of the skin skirt as we, uh, we said before. So all these factors are very important. And at last, commissural alignment. This is a very important uh, topic, burning issue. We need to work on that. You have had that lecture uh, from uh, Lars about that, and we need to understand how to play with the device and catheter uh, just to make sure that we get a proper commissural alignment. Uh, whatever device we use, we have to work on that beforehand. So having said that, let's now dive uh, more into details into the tips and tricks on how to get access to the coronary arteries post-AVI. And the best way to achieve that is to go through a couple of clinical uh, cases. So the first case I wanted to share is uh, that case of acute myocardial infarction. And if you watch the, the right picture, the picture on the right, you can see that this patient had a very uh, severe uh, disease just uh, in the mid portion of the, uh, the LAD with uh, a calcific but uh, and also thrombotic uh, lesion. And after this uh, self-expanding device, it was very difficult to get access to the uh, ostium, ostium of the, the left man. So the, uh, the tips and tricks that were used for was, were first advanced a, a 0.035 inches J wire through the struts close to the, to the left man. And as we were not able to candidate, uh, the trick was to use a guide extension just to get access uh, from a non-selective manner with the guide catheter, but the extensions, extension was able to reach the, uh, uh, the, the left main. So uh, this type of uh, trick uh, uh, is very important to, uh, to, uh, to, to get, to acquire how to connect the coronary arteries from a non-selective manner with the guiding catheter using a slippery hydrophilic wire and then a guide extension and then you can uh, continue with your regular PCI and achieve uh, and treat this uh, acute myocardial infarction. And this is the final result for the patient and still with that non-selective um, um, cannulation of the, the left main. And one important uh, thing that I didn't mention is that usually you use uh, for the left uh, system a guide catheter that is uh, half a size shorter than the regular uh, guide catheter for a, a native uh, anatomy. This is a second case, uh, still with a, a self-expanding uh, platform, and this was a patient that were, was uh, treated uh, close to 10 years ago with a, a Medtronic core valve evolute R at that, at that time with a very nice implant, a high implant, no regurgitation, but that the patient came, uh, came back several years afterwards uh, with an acute myocardial infarction, a pulmonary edema related to a, a calcified a distal disease of the left man with a chronic total occlusion that was already known uh, from the obtuse marginal branch. So uh, all the focus was put on the distal left man and the uh, proximal LAD. And these are the challenges that we encountered with this uh, patient. As you can see, we, uh, we tried to um, get access with the guide catheter. We thought that it was successful. We could wire the proximal portion of the, uh, the LAD with a, a floppy rotor wire. And then, as you can see, a 1.25 rotor burr was not able to uh, get across the struts of the uh, self-expanding platform. So that's what we did. The first thing that we did was to try to get access through a different strut. 
with once again a shorter guide catheter. This was the EBU30. And we used a very hydrophilic wire just to be able to cannulate non selectively uh, the, coronary, uh, uh, the coronary artery. And then uh, bring a, from a, a, uh, with an exchange procedure first a, 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 a micro catheter and second the, the, the floppy rota wire. Uh, and we uh, to try to be able to get uh, that uh, rotational atherectomy achieved at the level of the distal left main. And by changing the strut, once again, maybe not being extremely selective, but just avoiding that uh, connections, that cross connectors between uh, different rows of the, uh, the, the self-expanding platform, the scaffolding, we were able to get to bring the, the burr across the left main and across the lesion and to achieve a regular PCI and to get that. So once again, in a non-selective engagement, change the strut and try to use a, an, an hydrophilic wire just to get access to the coronary arteries. And this is the final result for the, the patient. The third case uh, that I wanted to share, uh, this is a, a patient that was uh, referred for a TAVI procedure. And during the, the, screening, uh, uh, the screening phase, we identified that very long disease of the mid LAT, the left hand and the mid LAT, with an FFR of 0.73. So uh, that patient combined the issue of a coronary artery disease and a NRX disease. So we had to define the strategy. So the first the device choice uh, plays a role in this type of scenario. So we, uh, when we went through the metrics of the aortic valve, what we understood is that we could use any type of type of devices, whether it be in uh, a Sapien 326 and Evolute Pro a plus 29 or a, a, a Portico or an Avitor 27. So we decided to go for a Portico uh, 27 in that case. Planning on the commercial alignment, just to be sure that we uh, preserve the access, future access to the coronary arteries for this patient. And we even decided, particularly for this uh, uh, patient, uh, to first do the TAVI procedure. This was a body code 27 and 29. With a regular implant, a cusp of a lab projection uh, going uh, very high and just making sure that we get a proper uh, ceiling with a mild regurgitation. And we can see, we could see that the commercial alignment was uh, appropriate for this patient. So afterwards, it was uh, not difficult to get access to the coronary arteries. So one very important trick Make sure that you are central when you get across the stent, the struts of the the uh, the, the TAVI device. So just to make sure that you are central, try try to bring the uh, the 0.035 wire within the left ventricle. The guided catheter follows. You are sure to be central and then to be on the side and then across the struts of the uh, the stent frame that because that could uh, be a way to either crush it or either embolize uh, the the TAVI device. So make sure that you get Central, central first, then you withdraw the, the wire, and then by pulling and slightly rotating the guiding catheter, it's uh, most of the time very easy to get access uh, to uh, the, the left main in that example. So play in that way just to make sure that you are central, and this is a very important uh, uh, trick. Uh, then this was once again a regular procedure with uh, the rota, uh, a rota wire, um, a floppy rota wire, 1.25 burr, and then pre deal, uh, this, uh, double dual stent, uh, DS uh, implantation, pot, uh, pot side pot, and then this was a regular procedure with final result that was acceptable for uh, this patient. So it's time to uh, summarize my main tips and tricks for coronary access post IV. The first one, if you don't know the patient, I would first go for an aortic root shot to understand the anatomy and the way the device is. Uh, deployed according to the surrounding structure of the patient. Second, consider using a pigtail catheter or placing the left, the left ventricle, uh, the wire within the left ventricle to, uh, to ensure you are inside the transcatheter heart valve, especially when you have a dilated heart valve with a stent frame that doesn't touch the aortic wall. Uh, second, for the left system, use a guide catheter that is downsized, alpha size, uh, as compared to what you would normally use. For the right the coronary arteries, that, to my uh, experience, is more challenging to uh, cannulate than the, the left coronary uh, system. You, you may use the, the uh, normal, the regular sized uh, guided catheters. My preferred one being Jet Right and that's left one 
uh, implants left 0.75, uh, implants right or multipurpose catheter. Uh, you need to consider non-selective wiring of the coronary artery because most of sometimes you you cannot get uh, get access, particularly for these uh, uh, patients that uh, have been treated uh, very early in the day, in the TAVI days and without commercial alignment, without the proper uh, implant depth uh, in relation to the coronary height. So we need to understand that sometimes we we may remain non-selective. We need to use micro catheter for exchange, guide catheter extension has to be liberally uh, utilized. Anchoring balloon uh, to advance the guide catheter extension is another trick uh, that we, uh, we need to, uh, to, to bring into the procedure when it comes uh, to, to get access to the coronary arteries. And at last, steerable guiding catheters or micro catheters like the Cobra or the Venture steerable uh, may be useful. So uh, I thank you very much uh, for your attention. Okay, so uh, uh, I think I, I can summarize. It's a little bit, it's a little bit, we overlooked a few things. The session will be closed now. We saw basically phenomenal two cases uh, by a very experienced team. Uh, the title of this lesson was Taver Coronary Access. I might add Taver at its best. And um, I want to thank the team in Toulouse. Uh, all the panelists um, from Korea, from uh, Taiwan and from India, from Japan, good friends that I've seen five years ago with Antonio Colombo when we did the cases there. <laughs> it's always good in these times to see you. And Dagbo sits in my favorite chair in Seoul where I used to sit. So um, say hello to everyone. We like to thank all of you, particularly um, good luck to uh, to the, uh, to the upcoming sessions. I hope to see you very soon again in good spirits, best health, and thank you very much for having us and sharing this wonderful session this morning. Thank you very much and goodbye. Thank okay. you. Thank, thank you. you. Great.